Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Andrew Odlisko. Andrew is a professor at the University of Minnesota. Before that, he spent more than half of his professional career in research at Bell Labs and AT&T Labs. After moving to Minnesota, he was the founding director of the Digital Technology Center and has been head of the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, as well as an assistant vice president for research. He has three patents and has written over 150 technical papers on a variety of topics such as cryptography and probability theory. He is a fellow of the International Association for Cryptologic Research and the American Mathematical Society. He started his studies of the economics of the internet at AT&T in the mid 90s and is probably best known for his early debunking of the myth of internet traffic doubling every 100 days, as well as for his thesis that connectivity and not content is king. He has since broadened his studies to consider more general interactions of technology and society. So Andrew, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. So let me start by putting question one on screen and uh, recapping what it states, which is, how do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telcos? Thank you very much for this very gracious introduction. Yes, this the question that you asked is a very important one, that one I've been involved in with for over 25 years in various forms. And uh, one of the striking things from the very beginning is uh, how people are most willfully misinterpreting the evidence that's available there. I mean, literally bl willful blindness to the uh, basic facts uh, of the internet economy. Uh, so the issue is that content it's, is not really critical you know, for success of the internet. It's really connectivity. Volume of data is, yes, that is classified as content. And by the way, here we should probably be somewhat precise and say, what do you mean by content? In my mm -hmm. case, by content, I mean material prepared by professionals. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, what we, this podcast is sort of like that. Uh, although that's a little bit in the middle. One of the nice things about the internet is lets us kind of bridge the gap between traditional one-on-one -on -one connectivity and uh, mass uh, content distributions, things like newspapers or movies. Uh, so if you simply look at the volume of data that's going, the volume that's going over the inter telecommunication networks, it's primarily content movies, video clips and movies and such like. On the other hand, when you look at the value of communications, what people really care about, it's relatively low bandwidth, typically mostly one one on one, one to a small group of people communication. And this is harder to do now, but say about 15 or so years ago, in the era when you had to pay for each text that you send and you paid by the minute for phone calls, I actually had some nice statistics I would show in my presentations showing this inverse relationship between the price people were willing to pay and the value and the volume. The texts were really by, by far the highest. Actually, ringtones were even higher. The texts, voice, and video also at the very bottom. So yes, people access a lot of content that generates a lot of traffic, but that doesn't have much value. So therefore, all these plans so to try to fund the net telecom networks by somehow taxing the distribution of content are delusional. Uh, actually, if you simply look at the numbers that we have for the volumes of different sectors in the economy, it's totally uh, out of uh, scale. Uh, the world spending, around the whole world, people are spending almost 2 trillion euros per year on communications. Okay. Uh, you look at Netflix. Netflix is supposed to be generating at least a third of the volume of traffic on the internet. Netflix annual uh, kind of uh, revenues are around 40 billion euros. 
one fiftieth of all the world spends on, uh, you know, on telecommunications. So to say we're going to tax Netflix to support expansion of our network, uh, that is simply crazy. So, so, so yes, I think the question that you ask is a very important one, but uh, in some sense you, you really have to step back and you really have to uh, kind of look at this setting somewhat differently. Like I, I guess it takes a professor of mathematics to do the math and conclude that uh, probably it doesn't make sense uh, fr from a, a numbers point of view. Um, often uh, maybe policy is is governed by too many lawyers and not enough mathematicians <laughs> could be one of, 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 of the things we, we, we take from that. And it, beyond the numbers, I think there are maybe intangible um, risks uh, that, that hide in that discussion. And that's the, the topic of the second question, which is what are the inherent dangers uh, that you can spot, if any, of big tech being requested to pay for uh, the network of telcos? There are many. Well, first of all, it, it ain't going to work, uh, <laughs> kind of briefly, because <clears throat> there is not enough money there. Mm -hmm. Mention Netflix is one example. The second or the other really giant generator or creator of traffic on the internet is Google through YouTube. Mm -hmm. However, it's not clear what the revenues of YouTube are, whether it's even very profitable. I mean, it's very valuable for YouTube in terms of getting information about users and various other things, but that's not where the big money comes from. If you simply separated YouTube from uh, Google, um, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have much of a financial effect. Yes, Google is fantastically profitable, and uh, but that's for other reasons. And in fact, uh, in terms of talking about big tech, I think simply talking about getting them to pay for the telecom infrastructure is the wrong approach. I've been arguing for again over 25 years, more than a quarter century, that yes, big tech or the platform companies will need to be regulated. I think the steps that Europe is taking and the <clears throat> United States is far behind towards regulation of platform companies are moves in the right direction, but still stop quite short of where it's going to have to end up with when you're talking about somebody you know, providing basic infrastructure, then basic uh, economic, political, legal, logic, as well historical precedents say that is will have to be regulated. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you don't regulate it by taxing the volume of traffic. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is that uh, say if you go so netflix you just simply can't tax much out of it because there is not much money google yes google has these fantastic profits uh, you could but if you tax google on volume of traffic you're taxing youtube and so what google can then do is simply you know splinter or separate out youtube into another company and they'll be down to their usual providing information services, serving ads, and sucking our information into their, their data centers, which doesn't take very much traffic relative mm -hmm. to uh, YouTube. Uh, so basically, you're kind of uh, taxing um, sort of these big platform companies. I think it makes quite a lot of sense from general public policy point of view that there should be appropriate taxes they've been able to get away with shunting their operations to places like you know ireland and you know the hammer islands or other low tax operations which i think you know should be dealt with but that's not an argument for letting telcos tax them or so uh, i think the two things should be treated very separately so yes and of course <clears throat> what would likely happen is if you did try to impose a kind of bit tax on uh, big telcos, uh, they, there are various technical ways of bypassing it. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, instead of YouTube serving the videos from its uh, own servers, what they could do is, well, we're only providing information service. Most of the most of the videos on YouTube are provided, uploaded by users. YouTube could simply say, well, we're only going to provide you with URL 
for the you know for the this video that a particular user is making available and so now instead of sending this terabit of traffic every second from our servers you go and get it yourself and if you don't get it well then we'll put up a nice service saying well this european tax prevents us from providing you with quality service go complain to your politicians <laughs> something like that so there are all sorts of games that you would be inducing big tech to play if you try to do it so i, I think no i'm not against taxing big tech i think it's well under tax and there are other public policy reasons for trying to uh, regulate control it but to try to tax them for the benefit of telcos that does not make sense the taxation element that you bring about is is i think right if we go into sector specific taxations for everyone that claims that they are being harmed by big tech or multinationals in general that doesn't seem like a very public interest type of approach so probably a more uh, umbrella type of taxation uh, that that is more efficient than what's in place at the moment seems seems more rational and then the other thing is when you said they they will try to bypass it i suddenly had a reminiscence of peer to peer and and you know everyone hosting it on their own server and starting to share content that way um which which was you know the good old days to a certain to a certain extent for for many of us the way we we shared content in in the well, early days of the internet so Yes, uh, and in fact, that might be a not unreasonable way. Actually, in some sense, I am kind of quite supportive of it because that might uh, kind of uh, have more of an open internet. I mean, this is again a general public policy question. Right now, what we're seeing is the internet being kind of controlled by, to a large extent, by a few large platform companies. Uh, exploiting network effects and taking certain steps to make the, the dominant mode. I think there are big advantages to having a much more decentralized system. But again, that's a more general public yeah. policy question. You don't deal with, you don't encourage uh, that move by letting the telco stacks uh, platform companies. So, so having having identified a couple of issues, but but basically concluded that the the current yeah. solutions being discussed are the wrong ones. Um, the third question is more is more um, specific, and that is, do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech and telcos in infrastructure as suggested by some? Well, again, depends what you mean by some. So, yes, I think it's appropriate to compare them. But again, I think much of the public discussion has been framed in the incorrect way, which is kind of, again, almost in willful ignorance of the facts. Uh, if you actually look at big tech, uh, the big platform companies, they are investing a lot in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They are building these giant data centers. They are building quite a bit of fiber, especially if you look at submarine cable construction over the last decade and so on. Uh, I think most of it has been funded by these large companies. They haven't had to fund much of long distance fiber because that's already available. They could just lease it for the most part. Uh, so ba basically what's been happening is that big tech has been investing a lot mm -hmm. in infrastructure. On the other hand, also what's happened is that say, if you go back 30, 40 years ago, in those days, telecom was at the frontiers of uh, high-tech, cutting-edge technology, um, computing, transmission, all these things were often had to be specially developed for needs of the telecom. Mm -hmm. What's happened is that to a large extent, as a result, transistor, which came out of telecom, out of the labs initially, made possible the rise of the computing industry, and that one has now essentially invaded telecom and that has me meant that both switching which was very complicated and long distance transmission are relatively inexpensive which is why people like uh, companies like google or facebook or amazon are able to build out that infrastructure they are doing a lot of what telcos used to do so in some sense what's left for telcos is still a very big piece. I mean, so you're still talking about, you know, building up, uh, you know, fiber networks to the home, build, putting up towers for uh, wireless communication and such like. 
this is what's really left to the telcos. That's the, the domain providing basically what are scornfully called uh, dumb pipes. But that's really the natural realm for them. That's mm -hmm. what they should really be doing, providing dumb pipes and not try to play in an area that they are culturally and structurally not suited for, namely content. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a long history going back centuries to the days of uh, uh, of ordinary snail mail, of uh, 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 carriers, uh, communication carriers being fascinated by content. But that's not what's really their main value they're providing. It was connectivity that mattered. Mm -hmm. Providing dumb pipes does require substantial skills, being able to connect any of the many billions of people on Earth mm -hmm with the ability to communicate with anybody else and do it reliably, that takes a lot of funding, a lot of skills. In that case, that's what telco should be doing. Uh, in some sense, you could have argued, uh, some have argued, I, I certainly thought so back a couple of decades ago, that telcos could get into what we now call the cloud infrastructure, big data centers, and so on. Uh, well, they failed at it. They tried, but they failed the platform companies to cover that area too, which again, I think maybe that was kind of uh, foreordained by the kind of, kind of cultural backgrounds of them and so on. So yes, I mean, there are different contributions. You can compare them, but basically I see you no know, telcos and the platform companies as complementary. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of, uh, they should each uh, stick to their own uh, kind of knitting in, in that sense, and uh, kind of uh, go on in that way. I must compliment you, Andrew, for for making the building of dumb pipes sound sexy <laughs> for telcos, <laughs> and, and 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 encouraging them to be proud <laughs> of their pipes. Right. Well, and that's a problem again. Dumb pipes. It, it, I mean, it's, it's really profitable. It's really amazing, especially when you look at uh, you know, the transformation of the cable networks in the United States. Uh, so I remember having some discussions with uh, people, high-level um, managers in, tele in uh, cable companies back 15 or so years ago, who were so wedded to the delivery of uh, TV and, you know, but if you simply look what was happening, it was clear that they were getting much more money per megahertz of spectrum on the network from provision of this world of these still small internet service uh, services. Now the cable companies are giving up on all this bandwidth of TV. They don't want to be in the business of uh, kind of trying to extract that money, let the Hollywood deal with, uh, you know, with the customers. They provide dump pipes. Um, and that's really their natural domain. Um, okay, I, I, I think that we, we've covered the the numbers, uh, let's say, behind the discussion that is taking place. We've covered the practical reality and also the, as you said, the value that users uh, find in connectivity as opposed to content. Um, it probably is also re reflected that value of connectivity with the success of social media, because social media is about connecting right. people, <laughs> maybe more than content. I mean, you connect them with content, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's connectivity. Um, we, we've reached the, the moment where you can have your, your two minutes of fame, and I'll uh, put the two strong ladies of Brussels uh, on screen, uh, our President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and President of the European Parliament, Roberta Mazzola. So, box moment, if you have, you know, out of your long experience, uh, at a technical level, at an economical level of understanding the internet and how it functions, if you had one message to deliver, a short message to deliver to the EU institutions about this discussion, what would it be? My message would be that they should really take a sober look at the situation, look at the economics of the internet, and realize there really are two separate domains in there. One is providing services um, and providing uh, kind of uh, uh, connectivity to people. Another one is providing the dumb pipes. 
basically the, the actual infrastructure which enables delivery of these services. Both need to be regulated um, in that case, but they should really be kept separate. And one should kind of uh, avoid the delusion of thinking that value of the network is in the volume of pipe of, of bits that are transmitted. That is really not uh, the, where the value is, and what should people should be concentrating on. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your contribution. Um, somehow they must have heard you uh, before you even spoke, because I think we're expecting a consultation on this topic. So at least they seem to have taken a step back uh, and, and have the intention of, of analyzing what's at stake. And hopefully they will um, uh, you know, reach similar conclusions to yours. And I encourage you maybe to con contribute to that consultation once it's out. Uh, well, if you let me know uh, how it can be done, I'll be happy to do it. On the other hand, I don't have much hope for it because this uh, content as skin delusion has been present for centuries. And it's, it seems that no amount of evidence is going to disabuse decision makers of it. Uh, my former employer, AT&T, just over the last few years, wasted what is probably a few tens of billions of euros by getting into content business. They got out of it and so on. It's very really hard to do a clear accounting to figure out how much they lost because there are also opportunity losses and other things in there and being settled to extra debt. But it's just one of a series of essentially endless misadventures in the content business by the communication carriers. Well, I mean, um, I'm hopeful, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> I'm hopeful that they will see the light. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for your contribution. And probably this, there will be follow-ups to this podcast once we know more about the plans of Brussels. And um, we might reach out then uh, to you again just to see how you feel about whatever the commission will produce. Thank you so much.